Well, thanks a lot. It's a r real honor to be here and talk about the work we're doing at the Broad in the, in the Cancer Genome Analysis Group led by Gaddy Getz. Um, I'm going to talk about basically two subjects. Um, one is just sort of the, the great diversity of, of tumor projects that we're seeing now and the, the spectrum of mutations in them, but then also about improvements that we're making to our statistical methods for picking out significantly mutated genes. And then at the end, I'm gonna to try to tie it all back together. So we're at a really amazingly exciting time now where in TCGA and other projects, we've, we've started to sequence you know, thousands of, of exomes and genomes, and, and there's you know, 20 or 30 tumor types listed here um, this, this plot here shows the, for each, each patient, each cancer patient whose, whose uh, exome was sequenced, it's showing their, their total somatic mutation rate. And you can see it varies over four or five orders of magnitude. Um, from uh, tumors on the left, like uh, leukemias and childhood tumors, which have very low mutation rates, all the way on the right to melanoma and lung cancer and other other tumor types that are associated with known mutagens that have among the highest rates. So this already poses a, a big challenge uh, dealing with this, this you know, vast regime of different mutation rates. And then on top of that, the, it's not just that the total number of mutations increases, but the types of muta mutations change. And that's illustrated in the bottom panel here where these six different colors show the, the six fundamental kinds of mutations you can have. And that is, you can be either on a CG-based pair on, or on an AT-based pair, and then you multiply those two possibilities by three more possibilities, reflecting the three different bases you can change to in each case. And so if we, if we kind of zoom in on one of these tumor types, ovarian, which was one of the first TCGA tumor types, and also it happens to have of a, a very well representative uh, mutation spectrum that we kind of call the vanilla mutation spectrum. It's pretty much dominated by the C to T uh, mutations and, and it's kind of flat everywhere else. So the, these are again these six, these six colors of these six fundamental kinds of, of base changes. But then within, within each square, it's broken down further by the, uh, the, the context on the left and the right the left neighbor and the right neighbor. So you can see that this group of four bars sticking up here, these are the CPG dinucleotides, well known to be very highly mutable because of methylation. And, and they have, you know, per, per site, they have a much higher mutability than, than other bases. And we see a very similar pattern in GBM. Here it's even more dominated by, by those CPG transitions. Uh, these, these plots here have kind of been scaled to the near the maximum. So. So here, everything else has, has kind of fallen down flatter in comparison. Uh, it's a totally different matter when you go to lung cancer, where here now you have these, these cyan-colored bars sticking up that are C to A mutations, and they don't, they don't have a particular sequence context preference. Um, when, this is lung squamous. When you, when you look at lung adeno, that, that C to A um, component becomes even even more, uh, more important and becomes maybe even the dominant part of the mutations there. Um, melanoma, the C to T mutations are the vast majority of mutations, but in contrast to the, the sort of vanilla spectrum, uh, the context doesn't matter here. It's just C to T transitions at any, any Cs. Now here's, here's some interesting new tumor types that are coming out of the, the TCGA pipeline. The first one is cervical where it kind of looks like the vanilla spectrum, except now you have this back row, the red, the cyan, and the yellow back row sticking up. And that represents contexts where the, the, the five prime base is a T. So these are TPC dinucleotides. Uh, this, is, this is the first tumor type that we see this in, in, in TCGA. And cervical is known to be associated with HPV. And there's also some suggestion in the literature that uh, HPV infection is associated with this mutability of TPC dinucleotides, so this kind of makes sense. Uh, we also see the same, same pattern in bladder, almost the exact same uh, spectrum. So this is really tempting to, it, it's tempting to speculate that, that bladder might also have a viral component, and that'll, that'll be interesting to see. So an, an alternate uh, re representation of this data uh, which uh, Dr. Lander showed in his keynote this morning, is this kind of radial plot here where 
now the distance from the center reflects the total mutation rate, and the, uh, the sort of angular position reflects what, what is the kind of spectrum. So, so now you see the, the lungs segregating, the melanoma has its own sector of the plot, et cetera. Um, and, and, and here up in the, where the orange oval is, this is this sort of TPC dominated cohort with the cervical and some head and neck tumors and also now the, the, bladder, the bladder set. Now if you, if you focus in on these, these uh, sectors highlighted here, you can, you can look at this bar graph plot um, for, for each of those. I don't know if my pointer stopped working. Oh, no, it's just kind of dim. Uh, anyways, uh, the, you can see that the, H, the head and neck, uh, cervical and bladder, that's the one with the, the back row standing up. And everywhere else, it's pretty much the, the yellow bar standing up except for, for lung. Okay, so now I'm gonna move to the, the, the second part, which is, um, how, do we, how do we go from, from these sort of descriptive observations of mutation spectra to actually finding significantly mutated genes? So this is the algorithm we've been working on for a few years called MUTSIG, which picks out significantly mutated genes. It starts from a set of patients and the mutations observed in them, kind of tallies them up and does some kind of statistical stuff to, to figure out a score and a, and a cutoff. So the very, the very most naive version of MUTSIG uh, assumes a constant background rate across the genome. Uh, so specifically that there's no difference between sequence context, which we know isn't true from the previous slides, but also that all the patients have the same mutation rate or that we model them with an average across the patient set. And furthermore, that all genes uh, are modeled as having the same uniform background rate across the genome. So. Uh, as, as I said, we know, we know the sequence context matters because you might be looking at melanoma where the vast majority of mutations are these C to T mutations that are UV induced and A to T mutations are, are relatively much less frequent. So, so if you look at, if you pick these four genes, you might see that there's this sort of con constant background of, of UV induced mutation. But if you have one gene, this gene X here that, that has you know, the less common mutation, you might be tempted to, to, to weight gene X more, with more importance, despite the fact that it has the, the fewest total mutations here. So kind of analogously, if you look at patients, you might have two patients that have very different mutation rates. Uh, patient one might have a much lower mutation rate than patient two. And again, if you see that gene B is mutated in patient one, where, whereas, all kind of all genes are mutated in patient two. You might you might be more drawn to gene B as a potentially important cancer gene, even though it has the fewest mutations and it's mutated in uh, the fewest patients. So the sort of the third item on the list here, as we as we make our algorithm more refined, what about genes? Genes themselves could have different mutation rates across the genome. So here's four genes, you know, sort of in increasing order of number of mutations, but how do you know which, which one is the driver here? Uh, with the previous two cases, you could sort of pick out by eye where the, where, what, what was the background and what was the, the signal, but here it's, it, it's much less uh, obvious. So how do you know what the background rate of a gene is and, and why is it important? Uh, to, to expand on the, on the point that uh, Eric made in the presentation this morning, you could imagine two distributions that both have the same average mutation rate. Uh, in the first case, you could imagine that all the genes have the same mutation rate, and there you, you could draw a cutoff that is designed to have a false discovery rate of 1% or less, and that'll give you some hits. And that's probably good if you're, if you're dealing with a situation that it accurately represents. But you could have a slightly different situation where you have the same average mutation rate, but now you have a quarter of your genes being just just twice as, as, as highly mutated. Their background mutation rate is just twice as much as the, the, uh, the, the, previous, uh, the previous genes. So, so now your distribution is a sum of, of these two distributions of low mutation rate genes in blue and high mutation rate genes in red, and that gives you the fatter tail. Uh, and so if you use the same FDR cutoff here, you're, you're surely gonna be swamped by these false positives from the the distribution that has the higher mutation rate. So how do we get a handle on this problem? Uh, first of all, 
how do we do how do we know it's a problem? Um, this is a this is a look at the lung data, and here I want to refer you to the great poster that Brian Hernandez has uh, for those of you who who already didn't take a look at it. Um, but what I'm showing here is the the lung data. Um, the lung data, uh, you basically, uh, you get um, 800 and 843 significantly mutated genes. And that's kind of a, a mind-blowing number. Uh, and it's, it's sort of, when you see that uh, great uh, 146 of them are olfactory receptors, you start to realize that a lot of these genes are, are fishy. Uh, and, and there's the cub and sushi proteins, mucins, ryanidine receptors, titan. So, these are com kind of common offenders that show up on a lot of lists, and it would be great to find out why they're here. So um, one thing we know is that expression has, a, has an effect on mutation rate. The genes that are more highly expressed have lower mutation rates, but that only accounts for a, a, about a one and a half fold uh, difference in between the highest and lowest categories there. And when you look across the genome, you see that mutation rate varies by tenfold or more. This is showing the non-coding mutation rate across chromosome 10. So what we looked for covariates of this, basically. And we were, we were inspired by Sh uh, Shamil Sunayev, who, who pointed out that replication time co-varies with mutation rate in germline studies. So when we, when we plotted replication time on top of this, we saw that it's not a perfect match, but it's, it's really very tightly correlated, the black curves and the red curves. And it, it does explain quite a bit of, of the, the variation we see. And for olfactory receptors in particular, they, they, um, they replicate late. And as one example, here's a cluster of olfactory receptors on chromosome one that's in a very highly mutated part of the genome as measured by non-coding mutations and also replicates very late. So maybe this isn't a region of the chromatin that's kind of pinned to the outside of the nucleus. The cell doesn't really care about it. These are maybe old genes that don't matter anymore and they're left till the end of S phase when the nucleotide pool is depleted. So in any case, we probably want to be less excited about them. Here's this uh, cub and sushi domain protein CSMD3 that looked like the replication time assay had saturated, so we can, we can fix that and put it into our calculation. And basically the, the upshot of all this is that the mutational landscape is not flat, like, like the naive model assumed, but it's, it's got structure, and it's a kind of a high dimensional space with, with these covariates like replication time and expression level, and you sort of want to learn for each gene, what is its actual background mutation rate? And we have a lot of data so far, but we don't have perfect data yet, and we, we don't know this accurately for every gene, especially some of the smaller genes. So the trick we use is to kind of explore outward from, from the gene itself to its very close neighbors in the space and look at, look at them, look at, look at uh, how many silent mutations do the neighbors have, and how much does that increase our confidence about our estimate of the gene's uh, background mutation rate. So once we do that, uh, for the lung set, it's the, the, the improvement is really just tremendous. The, the, we don't lose any of the known genes, and moreover, they kind of bubble up to the top of the list. We only have to look in the top 12 genes to find the top uh, six known lung cancer genes, as opposed to having to go down to number 169 to find NFE2L2. And even better, the olfactory receptors drop way down to rank 181 and below, and so the gene list just cleans up to, 50, to 52 genes, and we're, we're a lot happier with this. And it holds true in other tumor types. And even, even better, it still works in the old tumor types that didn't have these problems, like prostate, which has a low mutation rate and was relatively well-behaved without these new improvements. We still get the three significant genes, and it uh, looks like it still works. So to kind of summarize and put it all together, this is the kind of the master equation that Gaddy wrote out on the board once, and you can see where these, these features play into it. The patient-specific mutation rate is FP, the gene-specific mutation rate is FG, and then learning these mutational spectra uh, you know, characteristics and how they apply to the tumor types and the individual patients, that's this weighted sum here of, of the different mutational factors. So uh, once, we, once we get all this in, we can sort of run MUTSIG on the, the pan-cancer set. And this is just kind of a preview of that, where tumor types are listed as the rows, and then these are the top significant genes by MUTSIG, and I've just labeled some of the, the known genes. 
um, because a lot of, uh, I should point out also that these, this is in, um, not all validated data, so we definitely want to follow up on a lot of this before we make any excited claims about new findings. And uh, with that, I just want to thank by, uh, stop by thanking all the people who have helped with this at the Broad. They're really too numerous to even fit on the slide. But I, I especially want to, want to thank um, the people who have been part of the MUTSIG team, including Peter Stoyanov, uh, Brian Hernandez, Marcin Imolinsky, Peter Hammerman, Greg Krukoff, Aran Hodis, and Chip Stewart, as well as Gaddy Getz for his unfailing leadership and inexhaustible stream of ideas and all the other, uh, all the other people at the Broad. And thank you all for your attention. <laughs>
get inside the spectrum for every type of cancer, do you see some sort of a classification or partitioning of patients? You know, so you know, some types have, I don't know, 16 different types of mutations, maybe these classify patients? I think it could definitely help to classify patients, like in the, the head and neck cohort. Some of the patients have that TPC dinucleotide signature that's, that's HPV associated, and some don't. And when we, when we looked, it actually did correlate with which patients had HPV sequences detected in their, in their DNA. There was, a, there was a good correlation there. So there, that's one example where the spectrum can independently stratify the patients like that. Uh, another example is in the colorectal set, where there's, a, there's the hypermutated uh, SIMP positive uh, uh, cohort. They have a slightly different mutation spectrum, too. Thank you. I think it'll be interesting to see if there are any gene signatures that go together with that, right? Yeah. But thanks. Okay, very last question, please, since you're already up. Quick uh, one. Yes. So I assume uh, you talk about uh, these uh, somatic mutations. Right. Uh, my question is, uh, if you look at the germline mutations, is this also true that uh, of at grade uh, genes uh, have uh, higher mutation rates? Yeah, I think that is true, yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks.